Hi there, everybody. My name is Dan Jackson. Hi, Dan. And <laughs> my name is Margo. Uh, Mar Margo DeCoster. Um, I'm the executive director of the new law lab at Northeastern University School of Law, and Margo was an intern with us just last summer. Last summer? Yeah. Seriously, I mean, it, it seems so much longer ago, right? So we are an interdisciplinary innovation laboratory at Northeastern Law School that is focused on merging creative arts and law to come up with novel means of legal empowerment. And what that means as a practical matter is that we leverage creative arts, uh, methods, and media to come up with uh, ways to help people understand and enforce their legal rights without having to hire a lawyer. And we're here to show you our, what, we think, what we think is a really cool tool, if I can actually pull it up. Come on, my friend. Why are you not letting me pull you up? Live demo. What's that? Live demo, Dan. I know, right? Don't you love it? So much fun. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to show you a really cool tool, what we think is a really cool tool, um, uh, that we built with a brilliant digital scholar by the name of Stephen Braun uh, that takes the CAP API and allows you to search that uh, and the Northeastern Snell Library Digital Archive at the same time. So I'm going to pull that up, right? So here it is, the basic concept, right? Um, and we've actually got keywords, Boston Public Schools, segregation, search, <coughs> basic materials, and it allows you, so you, you basically, so here's uh, the first two lines are the CAP archive, and you can look at the cases, you can pull them up if you want. There you go. Uh, and then the archival materials show up there. I, I think um, when, Adam, when, we, when I showed this to you, uh, back at David's uh, 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 conference, you used uh, chowder and what else? Where's Adam? Is Adam still here? <coughs> chowder. chowder and what? No idea. It was something, chowder and something. So who wants to actually, who wants to give me a couple keywords to search? Start with the first. Come on. What do you got? Chowder and bread. Chowder and bread. Chowder. We'll see what we get. Who knows, right? No, seriously. I mean, that's... <laughs> right? So let's see what we got. Mm -hmm -hmm. It takes a little... It, it does its thing, right? Lots of archival... Oh, look. Chowder. The first referenced... Chowder. Reference to chowder <laughs> in the CAP database is... <laughs> ladies and gentlemen... 1879, Commonwealth versus Worcester. Worcester. Uh, bread is Case of Perry, 1781. Archival materials, let's see what we got there. Shall we? Hold on. Boom. Let's see what we got. The <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we actually got to the place where we came to develop this tool. Um, and got interested in merging digital archives with case law, hopefully to tee up a conversation uh, in tandem with our next presentation about the value or lack thereof, depending on how you feel, um, in this approach for law students and others. Um, so there, there's the tool. Um, we've done search terms. We think it's super cool, uh, but, and we've actually d developed a second iteration of it, um, which I will unveil at the very end of the presentation. Um, but before we get to that, I want to tell you a little bit about how our Legal Innovation Lab got involved in digital scholarship and di digital humanities and merging that with case law and law generally, uh, and how that has allowed us to grow as a novel institution within the School of Law at Northeastern across the river uh, and Northeastern University, and how that got us uh, uh, involved in wanting to play around with the CAP API which we had a wonderful uh, experience uh, doing. So how did we get here? First of all, uh, New Law Lab. We are a six-year-old innovation laboratory at Northeastern Law School. We got started, like I said, six years ago um, with the mandate to create an innovation lab within a law school. Um, digital scholarship was an early mandate for us, and one of the first things that we did was to partner with the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project. How many of you are familiar with that initiative at Northeastern? One person. Two people, okay. So uh, CRRJ is an effort to uh, 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 take law students and in a clinic environment 
and to get them to use sort of journalistic investigatory methods to uncover um, uh, unsolved uh, racial violence from the Jim Crow era, 1930 to roughly 1970-ish. And so the first, one of the first things that we did is we built a platform called New Law Maps, and we partnered with CRRJ, and we, um, we mapped some of the archive. Not a lot, just a few things. Uh, but it taught us a little bit about how you can actually take uh, digital archives and make them you know, manifest uh, in a platform that has something to do with law, right? Um, and so then we also got a chance uh, to scale this out through university grants. Uh, tier 1 Northeastern has a grant program called the Tier 1 Program to further explore this uh, and how the CRRJ archive could be digitized and make available to the public, right? So, and as a result of that work, about a year ago, we got an invitation uh, to work with Snell Library um, on the Boston Research Center, which is, let's see, a wonderful new initiative at Northeastern uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation. Um, and we were invited in for a conversation about what the law school might be able to do. Uh, again, taking digital humanities, digital scholarship, digital uh, uh, research, and merging it with law. And we had a conversation with them and said, you know, well, so what can we do here? And we, but the idea that we came up with was how might we make the experience of case law reading more dynamic and more interesting, right? So more connected to the types of materials that Northeastern Snell Library has been collecting in its digital archives over the past few decades. So how many lawyers do we have in the room? Raise your hand. So a few, about one third, roughly. Um, think about your law school experience, the first time when you dive into case law, how seemingly divorced from reality that experience is, right? I mean, seriously, it's just very, very, very dry, very dull. So enter the the concept of uh, what we call the Boston Desegregation Archive. We chose a seminal case, Morgan v. Hannigan, 1974, the Boston School Desegregation case. And we chose to annotate that case with materials from Snell's uh, uh, archive, which actually, they actually have a, a desegregation archive uh, from Boston's uh, unique history there, right? Um, and we had some pretty rich results, I gotta say. So, you know, some of them, as you can see, the uh, really wonderful ability to go through cases and events and materials at the end. Um, some of the materials, pretty straightforward. Um, yellow are the archival materials, so, you know, a memo, okay. That's not too unusual for a legal case, right? That you would find a memo. Um, a statement of Representative uh, Doris Burns, right? Again, not too unusual. Um, but when you get into some of the really tremendously powerful archival materials, like this. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We'll get there, I promise. That photograph kills me, right? This is a mother saying goodbye to her son on his first day of school when he's being bussed, right? As part of that court order from Morgan B. Hennigan. So Margot, we hired, who is a super, super talented uh, uh, person who, who was able to actually take the case itself and work with the archive and merge the two, and she's going to spend about five minutes telling you about what that looked like from her perspective. Yeah, so um, so I was really lucky to get involved with New Law back <coughs> in 2016 with Dan and Jules. Loved that experience and ended up coming back last summer and getting to work on this really, really interesting project, and it was really, really fulfilling. Um, and. So I became involved, my role was kind of to sift through these archival materials and to annotate the, the ones that I found most relevant. And I focused on materials that I thought shed light on the grassroots social activism at that time in the unfinished 
Edel for Educational and Racial Equity, mainly in the years 1963 to 1974. Um, in this case, there's a lot of emphasis on the Garrity decision itself and the racist backlash following it, but it's important to look at this text and to remember the, that the fight to desegregate schools was a battle that black parents and um, community leaders had been fighting for a very long time. Um, so what I did was I started by reading through the legal case and then doing some personal research on desegregation, um, identifying and highlighting passages in the legal text that I could then relate back to some of the grassroots histories that I had read about and could then be linked to archival materials in the digital repository. So this didn't look like this at all <laughs> when, we, when I first started working on it. Um, it was a huge Excel spreadsheet of like hundreds and hundreds of columns. Uh, well, not columns, rows, and many, many columns. Um, so in Excel, I included one column to the sentence um, within the case file that the source was related to, so that you see highlighted here. Um, and then I included the name of the organization that it was related to, an event, event or, or a person, the year of publication, a link to the source, the creator. Um, we had GIS data at one point, but we didn't end up using a map type thing here. The type, so if it was text or multimedia, and then a, an annotation that explained really why the source was relevant to the case law. Um, and I also spent some time in the actual archive itself at Northeastern, which was really cool. That's where we got all of these Boston Globe photos, actually. They weren't digitized, digitized before um, going into the Northeastern archive and talking with Jordana and um, Molly Brown. Um, so big thanks to both of them for actually digitizing these photos. Um, yeah, and so this includes archives from the repository, also from the WGBH archives, WBZ, also includes sources from Boston Fair Housing, Mass Federation of Fair Housing and Equal Rights, and also um, sources from the Black Women's Oral History Project, which is housed in uh, Harvard's archives, actually. So that's a little bit about that. And so and that led us to basically <coughs> the, the tool that we, um, when CAP went live and offered the API, we were like, okay, so how might we actually do something bigger than just this one case? How might we actually take or give people uh, out there in the world the opportunity to merge our digital archive at Northeastern with all this incredible case law, right? Um, and so we thought we would move beyond the Boston desegregation case and bring case law alive with digital archival materials and do it in a way that did not require a single person who worked an entire summer last summer <laughs> to bring this alive uh, through an Excel spreadsheet. Um, um, and so thank you to Harvard and the Case Law Access Project for making all of US case law freely accessible online. <laughs> this API and Bulk Data Service makes, as you all know, uh, you know 40 million pages of published uh, US court cases <laughs> available. Um, and Ravel, thank you as well. Uh, and so why not merge that with digital archives to be able to bring case law, which is incredibly dry and can be rather boring, uh, alive. Uh, I mean, <laughs> bless our hearts, lawyers. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so we actually, we came up with another iteration of our tool. I wanna show you it. So I'm gonna go ahead and search this again, segregation and busing, keyword one, keyword two, cases, DPLA, uh, that uh, digital, um, DP, what does DPLA stand for? It's the, it's the Northeastern, thank you. It's the, it, yeah, it's the Northeastern uh, Public Repository. Um, and so I, this is gonna populate in a moment. It takes a while for it to do it, so. We're um, working on that. What's that? Sorry about that, we're working on that. We're I'm not sure that it's actually, I'm not sure, it's not your API. Okay. I think it's Northeastern. <laughs> Ooh, look, it's alive. There it is. So, so the orange, uh, and from time to time, I do fall into a fake Irish accent because I'm in the middle of watching Dairy Girls on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me on that one. Um, so orange is the keyword number one, both in the cases and in the archival materials. Purple-ish is... Keyword number two, both in the cases and in the archival materials. Look at, isn't that amazing what you can see visually, right? By that over the, t over the time frame, right? Incredible. And then teal is both together at the same time. And just one, one archival material. 
Bustling does not solve segregation. <laughs> wow, amazing. Anyway, um, so uh, the point is this that we would like to make, that uh, I feel like we are just getting started with merging case law and digital archives. Again, this is just exploratory. We, are, we, we, are, we, have, we don't have a hypothesis. We're just actually exploring right now at this point. Um, the key components for us are a very patient and knowledgeable frontline digital scholar like Stephen Braun, who actually built these digital tools uh, and is starting this, um, this August uh, as a visiting professor in our uh, information design program at Northeastern. Um, digital archives that are available for search um, and most importantly, this effort uh, for the first time ever, all 40 million pages of US case law freely available to us crazy tinkerers. Thank you. I won't close your page, I promise. Thanks. Oh, all right, so uh, before we move on, let's take five minutes to uh, check in on questions, thoughts, next actions uh, related to this presentation. This is really just a comment, but uh, right now the Imaging Services Lab at Harvard's Widener Library is working with the National Archives in Waltham to digitize all of their Mornigan yeah. v. Hennigan papers. Yes. So yes. there may and that's be more Garrett, to add. Actually, that's Garrity's case file. The, 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 the ju I'm sorry, the, the judge. His, right. his actual uh, files from his chambers. Uh, so, that's what you're talking about, yeah. yeah so when yeah. they're ready, you can add those two. And so that and th that yeah, that opens up the possibility uh, that we're hoping to explore <laughs> as part of this exercise is you know most universities have a digital archive of some kind at this point. Most are pretty open to making them available for searching. Mm, Stephen pulled these things together like that. Yeah. I mean, and with. With CAP, I mean, the ability to search national archives against the, the Case Law Access Project, I mean, that's a tremendous opportunity to bring to life history for our law students in a way that is, and for researchers, I mean, in a way that just, it just, I mean, that, that photo kills me every single time I see it, of a mom with her son on her, his first day of school, um, and that brings busing, the whole thing, the whole crisis, the whole intervention to life in a way that, I'm sorry, you know, words are great, but that picture, that really does it. Yeah. And I think if we had more access to more archives uh, with, with your API, we could do amazing things, I think. What's different about having an API, a public API, that you can use to drive tools? Uh, a lot of what we've looked at today involves when you, uh, when you download the thing and you have it on your computer, you can make a thing. Uh, when we add an API like this, it allows you to be a hopper, to have users who come and have questions that they have. Uh, you filter them through your software, connect it to our API, and then make the digital experience for people. There's a lot of power to that, and power that we haven't really tapped yet. And so uh, that's certainly what I'm taking away. Thinking more about what those opportunities are for uh, letting people explore on their own archive in a new way. Uh, and by the way, when we build things, we try to build them so they do enable that kind of generativity. Uh, the historical trends tool that we launched this week is backed by a public API. Uh, if you don't like our interface to those engrams, uh, you can make your own <coughs> share your own version of that exploration with uh, your users. Other thoughts or reflections about this piece? 